Hello and welcome to the Clean Bill of Wealth podcast for Canadian doctors. I am your host, Galen Nuttall. Join me as I interview doctors and related professionals and talk about what it takes to achieve wealth in this, the Great White North. Not just wealth is measured by a bank account, but also family, faith, and health. Be sure to go to galenhelpsdocs.com. That is G-A-L-E-N. That is how my name is spelled. Helpsdocs.com to get access to my free video series where I uncover the top myths about growing your wealth as a doctor north of the wall. Now, please enjoy the show. Today we are here, uh, me and Sarah, two fired up, passionate CFPs. So um, what I'll do is quickly say what the purpose of today's uh, live is and uh, then introduce Sarah. So Sarah and I have known each other for a while now. Sarah was instrumental in me getting my certified financial planner designation. If anyone was following me on that journey, they know that it was a painful process and it was only Sarah who dragged me through it, <laughs> cricking and screaming and crying um, that I made it and calling her at the last minute, like, I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to pass this test and all this stuff. Um, the reason we're doing this is Sarah uh, and I, um, both CFPs, Sarah's been a CFP longer than I have, um, uh, both get really excited about financial topics that are really important to Canadians and have spent a lot of time as students of the craft, students of the business, the industry, demographics, and we just have these amazing conversations. And I said to Sarah, like, hey, like, why don't you and I actually record these so the world can benefit from our amazingness as we riff on what matters. So perfect. So Sarah, I'll let you introduce yourself, um, obviously, because uh, to let you know what you're all about. And there's one thing that I find really awesome about you that if you don't bring it up, I'll just throw it out there at the very end. Oh, that's, that's very kind. I'm excited to hear it. Um, so thank you so much for making time uh, to connect and to bring me onto your show. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've been in the industry for about 12 years. I really grew up in financial services. I didn't know right away that uh, I would be going into financial planning the way I have. I started out in a call center and uh, that call center experience in financial services, it gave me constant exposure day to day uh, with clients and financial advisors, financial planners. Uh, so I really got to see the nitty gritty of the experience and I got to see the full spectrum of what is good advice bad advice and no advice and what's the impact of all of those things and that's what really lit up my passion to get into financial planning so over the last about seven or eight years of those 12 years i've spent my career really focused on coaching training and supporting financial advisors and financial planners so i got my cfp designation uh, achieved it back in 2015 and was that was a long journey so i i totally know what galen's talking about uh suffering along the way but totally worth it it opened up a lot of doors and um it's really been a tool for me to express my passion for financial planning and also allowed me to take that passion out and really make a living at it by engaging directly with advice professionals uh, and helping them to become better planners. So I'm really, really fired up about financial planning, as you know, and excited to be here uh, and part of the conversation today. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. And uh, I didn't know that you worked at a call center or, or I hope I wasn't a terrible listener at some point when you were doing your bio no. at some event. <laughs> and I was like, to totally missed that. But um, the, uh, the thing I was going to say, um, you know, and it's a bit of bit tangential, but you have done transcendental meditation out in the desert somewhere. Yeah. Um, yes, that's right. Was it in the, was it in the States somewhere or was it in Canada? Yeah, it was in uh, Death Valley, California. And like truly, uh, so Death Valley National Park is really huge. It's got multiple yeah. uh, valleys inside the park. And so um, it's way out in the middle of nowhere. And I think slightly northern california but yeah i've actually done it twice yeah. i went again uh in march last wow. year so Very yeah cool. it's pretty awesome baby yoda definitely approves of transcendental meditation <laughs> in that valley um so so we have a long list of topics we will tackle over the the weeks and months ahead and but one one thing and you kind of talked about this a little bit in your own intro is um the value proposition of an advisor so you and i have definitely talked about this at length before and today we'll do a quick run through of what we believe it is that an advisor should bring to the table. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I guess one of the places this comes from is there's, I think there's a lot of, um, well, first of all, there's a lot of, I've, I've seen uh, levels of skepticism around, you know, advisors. Do I need an advisor? Um, you know, how does an advisor help me? 
Um, and I'm actually in a group. It's an international group. So they deal with a lot of like non-regulated entities where they're being targeted by like really bad, like non-regulated advisors. It's actually shocking. Um, but that, it comes down to like, what is it that an advisor brings to the table? And I guess like one of the things that I've looked at is, um, all right, I'll just go ahead and say it the way that I came about it. So uh, my background is teaching. I taught for years, a master's in education, became an advisor. And I had read a lot of books on what I thought was proper. Like the, what I was interested in before I became an advisor was, um, you know, day, kind of day trading or like picking stocks or like predicting the markets, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I read a lot of books about it. I thought I knew how to do it. Um, and I had some success with it. Sometimes I didn't, sometimes I did. Um, but at the end of the day, I didn't realize that on the long term horizon that it's um, nearly impossible to do um, like it's nearly impossible to be successful at that to the extent that the effort I'm putting in mm -hmm. is going to give me what I'm trying to get. So like to quote unquote beat the market or to quote unquote beat uh, uh, an investment. Anyway, so that's where I came to the table. And then as I became an advisor and got trained, I was starting to see like, oh, there's there must be some other thing out there that's that's not like it's they're saying like, you know, we're not really doing day trading. We're not doing active trading of stocks for people. We're not predicting the markets. And I grew up in the roaring 80s of stock market movies like, you know, uh, that that was the thing. People yelling on the with papers in their hands and the guys that were gurus at this sort of thing. Anyway, so then when I became an advisor, one of the things they said to me was, oh, well, you're going to get in front of people and you're going to look at what they have invested currently. And it's going to say something like, oh, they're in a two star fund and you're going to take them and you're going to move them into a four or five star fund. And I remember thinking like, how am I helping people? Like, how does that actually help people? Or like, how are these stars even tabulated? Am I actually helping people? And so I started delving deeper and deeper into what an advisor can actually help people do. So I just throw out there, well, the number one thing that I think a good advisor, one of the number one things is to help people identify their goal and work toward, like figure out a clear path to get to that goal. I think that's like yeah. one of the first things. What about, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, I, I totally agree. I think you nailed it with the goals, uh, especially because um, when it comes to the wealth management, like the funds and stock picking, all that stuff you talked about, you know, I know this is kind of a in that kind of technical effort on your investments. When you're linked to a goal, it's a lot easier to do the right things there, which are most of the things people don't understand, uh, like behaviorally, not selling, you know, panic selling, those types of things. So having goals is absolutely critical because it anchors you. Uh, and really in every effort, in any engagement with any kind of coach uh, or somebody who is working to support you, yeah, you want to have a goal so you know what direction it is that you're going in. I think that that's huge. And as I was listening to you talk about that, you know, the next big thing or what I think is part of that, that I think advisors have to bring to the table to be really good advisors and planners is to look at the whole person. Mm -hmm. So your money expert, but it's tricky because money, as most people can probably affect, affects everything. And so my goals, feelings, emotions, perceptions, about areas of my life that I might think are unrelated to my finances are actually mm. so uh, you have to have a goal you have to know where you're going and to set the right goal that advisor or that planner that professional that you are are working with you stand back and look at your whole situation and be willing to invest the time to get to know you so that you can uh, actually craft goals that will make sense in the long run and serve your real needs, right? Because the worst thing we could do, I just find out by thinking about trying to achieve and want. Yeah, and I that that's really cool. So looking at the whole person, um, because like you said, money affects everything, and I think there's definitely. So one of the things I talk about is double double advice. And one of the red flags I have for people, even though people may not like this, is if someone goes to an advisor and says, I want to buy this, I want to do this, can you do it for me? 
And if the advisor just goes and does it without asking why the person wants to do that, what they think it's going to do for them. I call that double double advice because it's kind of like pulling up to a window of a drive through asking for a double double. You get your double double. That's their job. They've given you your double. They haven't asked you, you know, do you have tachycardia? Should you be having caffeine? Uh, should you be having all this sugar? You know, should. And I mean, no diss on the double double. Double doubles are friggin delicious. But um. <laughs> I, it's kind of like, that's the transaction is like, give me the double, double. I drive away with my double, double. I drink it, whether it's good for me or bad for me, you haven't asked me any questions and I'm going to have it. And so when it comes with advisors, like, I feel like it's kind of like, or it's kind of like going to a doctor and being like, you know what, doc, my buddy, uh, he takes this antibiotic that I think would be really good for me. Like, I think you should give me that antibiotic. And the doctor just being like, well, all right, man, like your buddy knows. So let's give you that antibiotic. Um, <laughs> Without asking, of course, all the questions that need to happen before taking an antibiotic. Um, and so you mentioned feelings, perceptions. And that's another thing um, that I feel that um, it happens with a good advisor-client relationship is helping identify that goal. And then also looking at, you said the why, like why that's important. I think that's really important, too, because I've had people... Um, you know, and, and, and one last thing I'll say is, like you said, goals, feelings, emotions. I've sat... Like, I remember when I became an advisor and it was like, there's a certain, and I think there's a lot of this sort of in the DNA of the industry of, you know, someone wants to do something, you show them whether it's logical from a numbers standpoint, mm -hmm. and if it's not logical, they shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. So I get in front of, I work with a lot of medical professionals and a lot of them have a lot of debt when they get out of school and they start making good money, but they also still have a lot of debt. And so there's this big question of pay off debt or invest, right? And there is a numbers behind it where a lot of times it makes sense to uh, do both, right? But I've sat in front of doctors who have said to me, literally a doctor said this to me a couple of weeks ago. He said, I am allergic to debt. So yeah. I could say, but, 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 but like, look at the numbers you can get, you know, you could, you're, you could make more money in the market than your debt. And at the end of the day, you'll have more money and da, da, da. And if he's still not on board with that from an emotional standpoint, like still not on board with like still in that mindset of I'm allergic to debt. Yeah. There's only so far I can take them before they're like, I don't care. Like, and like all the logic in the world is not going to change my perception of debt and that sinking pit in my stomach feeling. So with people like that, I'm just like, and or any situation where at least they're not doing something that's harmful. It's like, fine. Like if you emotionally cannot wrap your mind around investing before that debt is gone, let's figure out how to get rid of it as quickly as possible. So you can work towards the future. And, and I, and I guess like it used to bother me when people did illogical things like that. Cause I'm like, no, I just have to keep showing them the numbers. And then I learned from a behavioral standpoint and from a mind, uh, the way our minds are created, like actually being presented too much logic actually makes brains shut down rather than, um, come on board with things. Yeah. I think that's such a, again, like another slam dunk because from the behavioral side, if you don't address those the the preconceived notions the ideologies the beliefs uh you will never get people to change and so actually i mm. uh, it, it's interesting because i was looking at um i was researching coaching programs last night like i'm planning my education for uh 2020 and like what's something new that i want to learn and this one school will talk to all about habit change coaching program and i thought this is uh really spectacular because a lot of financial advice has to do with changing what you're doing and it can be very mm. simple saying like you need to save 50 bucks a month so you need to start doing something you weren't doing before or you have a severe overspending habit and you need to stop doing that obviously it, it might be easier to put the 50 bucks away than it would be to stop the excessive spending whatever that looks like but they're both behavioral problems hmm and take the time to dig down into the root of how you feel and what you believe in order to understand exactly as you put it galen like what's actually what can we actually do because that example of that individual be means um even if they said to you even if you pressured them and you were a terrible advisor and you said you must do this thing this is how it's got to be done i just um the worst thing that could happen truly the worst outcome is not that they would uh, listen to you and do it, even though it hurt. It's not that they would, oh, I don't like Galen, so I'm going to go somewhere else. It's that they would say, okay, 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 I'll do it. Then they'll mm. walk away. They won't take the action 
They mm-hmm, won't do mm-hmm. anything else that's good for them. And then they won't go and get any more advice. So not only is it critical <laughs> to understand them behaviorally and cater to them behaviorally, uh, but you have to recognize that as a the, for a good financial advisor, there is some recognition of the, I, I don't know if it's safe to use this word or not, but somewhat of the fiduciary nature of our relationship, like mm-hmm. the, the duty and the obligation that the advisor owes to the client. So critical for the advisor to be able to see that bigger picture around the client uh, in order to dispense the right advice and to dispense it at the right time. You know, I had uh, uh, many, many moons ago when I was studying yoga, so I actually was a yoga teacher in a former life, uh, the teacher that I worked with often would say, you can only give people as much truth as they can handle. Mm. So if you are financial advisor, if they're a good advisor working with the clients, uh, they're they're only going to do so much at a time and they're going to take an approach that's going to suit that client's attitudes and behaviors, just like that concept of, you know, I'm allergic to debt. So how are we going to work within that? I think mean, that that that's huge. And can I add one other thing that popped into my head? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there is another thing thing I think is really important with a good financial advisor is that right at the outset of the relationship, the financial advisor will look at what your responsibilities are as a client. So mm. when you come to a financial advisor, you're seeking good advice. You also have to right you get a notice for this. But when someone becomes a client or wants to become a client of a financial advisor, it's important for them to acknowledge that to really get the most out of this relationship, you're going to have to bring some things to the table too. That might mean that you have to do some homework Mm -hmm. and gather some documents, or that might mean that uh, over time, as you build trust, we're not saying you need to do it the second you walk in the door, but if you can walk in there and have a willingness to be vulnerable and to be open and to talk about how you feel about money and what your goals are and all that great stuff, uh, you will get a lot of that advice professional. And so I think a really good advice professional will set that expectation with you right out of the gate. Uh, very sophisticated ones or financial planners, they will document that as well. So there will actually be terms of engagement. And if you're not um, being asked of anything at some point in time in that relationship, they don't have to be big things. But if you're not hearing that from the advisor, I think that could also be a red flag because if they're not yeah. willing to be honest with you about what your obligations or your responsibility are, um, you're not going to get as much out of it. And maybe that means they're not willing to dig deep. So how shallow is that advice going to be? Yeah. No, I like definitely something you said that resonated was, um, and I'm typing down some of the things you said, so I don't forget them. Um, uh, where was it? Oh yeah. You can only give people as much truth as they can handle. And so I've definitely seen that, like, um, you know, a false belief that I've seen people have is that, uh, you know, and just to talk about investing, like, um, you have to, you have to be willing to lose everything in the markets if you're going to invest. Like, and I'll tell you where this belief comes from with people is, you know, there's people who, you know, they grew up and their parents invested in a company and I won't name, but we can think of a lot of companies that were in theory, the next big thing. And they went under in Mm -hmm. Canada and the United States. And, um, they grew up with seeing their parents like, Oh my God, I just lost everything. Like I just invested, you know, whatever, 10, 20, 30, $40,000 in this company and it evaporated. Mm -hmm. And so if someone in that moment in time says, that's what it means to save and invest is to someday see that all disappear. Like it's, it definitely like, cause so uh, people that I've sat in front of that had that happen, they're like 35, you know, they've got a 30 year time horizon for their money and they're invested in something that doesn't even keep up with inflation because they're terrified of going through what their parents went through. And maybe in that first meeting, I can't say you need to go from here to here if you're going to hit your goal. And just like you said, I love what you said. It was, um, uh oh you said oh uh what was it uh put it you get in you get out what you put into it mm-hmm. and I'm in a slightly different context like what i say to people is like if i go to a vending machine and i can choose between bottled water which of course isn't good for the environment or coke at least the water's healthier than the coke but if i put in five quarters and i press the coke button i'm gonna get coke it's like i can't get mad at the machine because it gave me coke like right. i did what i did i got what i got And that's in the context of like habits because you're talking about habits a bit. And so it's like, if I don't 
save the money I need to save or if I don't invest it the way I need to invest it, I'm going to get what I'm going to get at the end of the day. And I think that a lot of people have, you brought up vulnerability. There's definitely a lot of people that come to the table with me with, and I mean, I think almost everyone, a certain level of shame around money, a certain level, a certain level of shame around the way they've used their money. Almost everyone I sit in front of feels like they should have done things differently. And until we can get a little bit past that of, you know what, you put in five coins, you press the Coke button, you got a Coke, like fine. Like we can change that. Like we can do something different going forward. And the more people can get attached to that goal, the easier it is to change that behavior of, well, I'm not going to keep pushing the Coke button because I'm drinking too much sugar. You know, I'm going to start pressing a different button or I'm going to start bringing my bottled water, you know, like a totally different change of um, habit. Um, but I like that you brought up you know, the vulnerability aspect because it is. And I mean, I have people have said to me, like, you know, I've met someone at an event. And they're like, what do you do? I was like, well, I help doctors use their corporations to retire. Like, oh, we should really talk. I'm like, cool, give me your email, email, back and forth for like six months. And, they, and I finally wrote to them. I said, look, you know what? I don't want to be bothering you. Just let me know if I should keep trying to sit down because we kept trying and it wouldn't work. And they finally said, no, 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 we're good. Let's sit down. We sat down like a week later and they said, you can probably sense how eager I am to talk about the mistakes I've made with money in the fact that i put you off for six months <laughs> and I said, fair enough. That's pretty common. And, but the good news is, you know, over the next year, we made some massive changes because they got clear on what they needed to be doing to get where they wanted to go. We made some very strategic actions with the corporation. Like we did some really great stuff and now they're like super on track to where they need to go. So it was a lot of fun. And of course they had to get over that initial, like, Oh my God, I'm about to, you know, bear all when it comes to the money with this person uh and i feel and, and the getting over those feelings or getting through those feelings of shame or um you know judgment that really um that resonates very deeply with me so we were actually texting last night and i i mentioned briefly um something that i was looking at doing this year and yeah i wish this is maybe slightly off talk topic about what advisors bring, but uh, in in that engagement of financial advice, that's exactly what every person is doing when they walk into a financial advisor's uh, office. It is you are getting naked financially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In order to uh, do the work that needs to be done, you need to bear all. So I think that's such a huge thing to understand about what it means to seek to really seek something beyond on very limited transactional advice. So for example, if I just want to go and buy this term life policy and I'm just going to do this one tiny thing, then yeah, that's a different story. Um, if that's the route you choose to go, you don't necessarily need to get totally naked, although I am doing some insurance right now for myself and it does feel like I'm getting naked. <laughs> um, but in a, in a more comprehensive engagement, which is what I think you want in the long run, uh, obviously, as a CFP, I'm very passionate about comprehensive financial planning. Mm -hmm. It really is that, that vulnerability, like uh, bearing all and being willing to show uh, what you have. And a really good advice, it or so smooth you wouldn't see it happening, but they would put you in a position to help you feel comfortable. And even if, if they couldn't magically help you feel comfortable in the first session, there should be signs and indications that they're willing to, to, to work with you to get there, right? Like if, if an advisor is not willing to do that, again, like how deep are they willing to go? And if they're not gonna go deep, what are you gonna get out of it? Not much. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I, had um, when I started as an advisor, you know, there was training and the training was to ask people difficult questions or, you know, questions that people don't oftentimes want to think about. Like one of the questions I ask is if you had passed away yesterday, who would be impacted financially today and to what extent? And I hated asking that question because I'm like, people don't want to think about death. People don't want to think about this stuff. What if they say to me like, oh, God, uh, I don't know what would happen, you know, and I really but it was, at the end of the day to take the you know, doctor analogy again. It's kind of like going to a doctor and they'd like, well, I don't want to take your blood pressure because I'm afraid it might be high. Right. Like, and I don't want to give you bad news. So let's just not talk about that. I'm not going to look, you know, I'm not going to listen to your heart. Not going to take your blood pressure. Not going to test your reflexes. I'm just going to say everything's okay. Just take Advil or whatever. And we're going to be, it's really, and I mean, that analogy I think is actually pretty, pretty legit in the sense that if someone doesn't yeah. take any sort of assessment, 
Um, and like, and it happens, right? Like people come to me and they're like, you know, Hey Galen, uh, um, I had a client, I had a guy a while back. He didn't become a client for obvious reasons, but, um, he's like, Galen, I need, I need something that's going to make me, uh, enough money to offset my capital losses from last year. That's all I'm looking for. And I was like, okay, well, like uh, that might happen, but let's just delve deeper into why you want that, what you want, why we're investing, da, da, da. He was having nothing of it. He was like, he wouldn't even tell me like he wouldn't tell me anything like what the money was for, like who he cared about it going to. And we had a couple meetings and then eventually I just said like, this isn't going to work. Um, you're not even giving me the basic information I need to know that I'm doing the right thing for you. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, he had a ton of money. So like, just like, um, you know, it's like, Oh, that kind of hurts to lose like a giant, you know, possible case. But I just said to him, I was like, this isn't going to work. Like he wanted me to do all these analyses of interest rate changes internationally and stuff. And I was like, I don't know why you want me to do that. I don't know how you think that's going to help you. Anyways, long story short, um, he was unwilling for me to take his blood pressure, listen to his heart. And I just said, like, I just I'm my hands are tied. I can't help you if you can't. And I and I think he was really used to the idea of sitting in front of an order taker, a double double advisor and saying, give me this and giving it to him and um, not taking a, an assessment of the bigger picture. So, and I think that's fairly common, but most people, like if I can get around to educating them around what matters, if I can get around to educating them a little bit about like what, what actual planning looks like, as opposed to what they might be used to, then they can usually get on board with it and say, okay, cool. Like now I understand why that thing I thought was what I should be doing was not what I should be doing, but mm-hmm. there's definitely, and I mean, I'll have to get going, but um, the coaching aspect of the business is, is huge. Um, just being that sort of, I think you said something and you might've said the word coach. Can you use a word that made me at least think of like the idea of being a bit of a coach in people's lives of yeah. assessing and then seeing what people are capable of stretching them a little bit farther, you know, like a good coach would. And that hundred percent coaching is huge. Um, I mean, the whole relationship really, really is coaching. Like there's a massive amount of uh, technical expertise happening in the background. But if you think about how much, you know, versus how much do you do uh, give to the client to know as much as they want, right? But they only need maybe about 18% of what you actually have up here. Uh, a great deal of it is it's more about behavior change, right? Just how do you do the right things and do them consistently? And I want to quickly squeeze in one other thing, which is the other thing, another thing that a good advisor would do is also tell you when they don't know something. Um, I think it, it's important to know that uh, the spectrum of all the stuff of financial planning, that's a huge, huge comp- Compendium of knowledge, which being that we're geniuses, we have a lot of it right up here, Uh, but it's a constantly evolving and changing thing. And so a really, really good advisor sometimes won't have immediate answers to your questions. And if you're dealing with someone that never said, I would be more cautious about that person, actually. Absolutely. That was definitely a very good tip uh, to end on a red flag, big red flag. If you ask your advisor good questions and they never say, I don't know. And I mean, obviously, when they say, I don't know, it should be, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. Or I don't yes. know. And to be honest, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Sometimes it doesn't matter. But if it does matter, it's like, let's figure it out. Awesome. Cool. Well, this was amazing. Uh, Sarah, our first uh, endeavor into the two passionate CFPs. <laughs> we, the P stands for passionate. Baby Yoda definitely approves of the episode. He's given us the thumbs up with the little magic baby hands and um, <laughs> perfect. Thanks so much for joining me, Sarah. Yeah, it was really great. Thanks so much. And have a great day, Galen. All right, take care. This is your host, Galen. And I'll thank you for joining me at a clean bill of wealth, the podcast for Canadian doctors. I hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to check out my free video series at galenhelpsdocs.com, where I debunk some of the myths around wealth generation for Canadian doctors. Take care and talk to you soon.